Okay. Uh, so, uh, namaste everyone. Welcome to HSE's fourth Cha 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 episode. We're very excited to have with us here today Sean Binda of Hindu Lifestyle YouTube page. He's a very active and engaged Hindu on social media. Um, and we're very excited to finally have this conversation with him. So, Sean, welcome so much um, onto our platform. Namaste. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I do consider it an honor and pleasure to join everyone in conversation today. Um, hope, hopefully we can have a pretty lively discussion. Yeah, so first of all, I just wanted to um, start the conversation off by asking you what motivated you to actually start the um, Hindu Lifestyle channel. And can you just give um, our viewers a bit of a background about that journey and, and what that's all about? Sure. Um, so, I mean, depending on how much, uh, how long you have, I, I, I could go into my whole history, but uh, to kind of make it short, uh, I was born here, raised in Toronto. Uh, my parents are of a West Indian background, so they were born in the island of Trinidad and Tobago. They came to Toronto in, in the 70s. Uh, I was born in 1981, so I was starting to get up there in age. Um, and we were actively involved in the Hindu community here in Toronto. When I got older, I started to participate and actually take an active role in uh, teaching in the Balvikas classes that uh, were a part of the temple that I attended. And being part of those classes, I, I did have the opportunity to actually meet with a lot of teenagers, a lot of university students, um, and sort of get a feel for, you know, uh, what is it that, that they wanted from the classes that I was teaching? And some of the feedback that I got from them was that, you know, you should probably, you know, start an Instagram page or a website, you know, post some of them, like the lessons and, and everything else. And I had originally told them that I'm like, you know what, websites are a dime a dozen these, these days. There's so many people that are sharing information, you know, what, how, how, is, how is my style or whatever you want to call it going to be different? And after some thinking, that's, that's when I realized that it, it probably had more to do with actually uh, the interactive nature of, of the classes that we had, that I actually stumbled upon YouTube in, in the sense that I started searching for people like myself and, find, and tried to find out if there was anyone in the space of the similar background of, as, as myself. Meaning that, you know, uh, someone that grew up here in the West in, in North America, where uh, Hinduism is, is not uh, the, the, re the religion of the majority, and find out if, if anyone was actually doing anything like, you know, what they call modern day YouTubers. And that's what sort of uh, prompted me to say, you know what, let's start something a little bit different. And um, I, I wanted to do something coming from someone growing up here in North America, uh, because the challenges that sort of I face growing up uh, is the same challenges that a lot of the youngsters growing up now, those that are in high school in, in, in university are going to face. So that's what motivated me is that teaching, being part of the Balvikas, getting feedback from those same university and high school students for, you know what, we need to start being in this space. That's what prompted me to start the channel. That's really awesome that the response actually came from within the younger Hindu community. Um, it shows that people are trying to be actively engaged and, and, and it's good also that they found someone like you who's able to cater to that audience. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, uh, that's, that's um, absolutely right. Now, I, I mean, when I started, like, uh, talking in, in front of the camera and, and like, actually doing the, the videos, you know, uh, wasn't, wasn't easy. Um, it, it, it does take practice to be somewhat engaging, um, uh, but it's, it's using the feedback from the students that I taught um, you know, that's what sort of shaped the, the whole nature of the video. So like one of the things that I tend to focus on is, is try not to make the videos like 30 minutes long because yeah. pe people's attention span is, is not going to be that un unless it's like, you know, like an interview or something along those lines. So most of my videos tend to be uh, anywhere between three to five to, to, to six minutes long. Uh, short, you know, get to the point and something that, you can easily digest. 
Sure. So you mentioned that uh, your YouTube channel wants to address a lot of the challenges that younger people are facing um, sort of directly and head on, especially coming from someone who's lived through a lot of those challenges since your family came over to Canada when you were younger, I guess, or probably before. So your before first, I... second generation um, yep. born here in the West. So what from from your own experiences and also from interacting with younger people who are, you know, in Gen Z right now, what are some of the challenges that you've found are facing younger Hindus here in the West and Canada and the U.S.? Um, I think an overarching challenge right now is sort of this mind share is, is how do you capture the minds of these young people growing up? Uh, when I was growing up, like there was no social media, there was no cell phones, there was like no YouTube, there was no Facebook, there was no Snapchat, there was nothing along those lines. Um, so that means, so that meant that that if you went to the temple, that that that's all that you had. Whereas nowadays, you could go to the temple, but if you're on your cell phone, that's not capturing the mind share. So. I, I think the biggest challenge right now is making Hinduism, uh, making it attractive and being able to capture the attention in that split second. Because if you can't capture it, then most, more often than not, people are probably going to be bored in what you have to say. The other challenges that I, I find is, is maintaining that sense of community um, within youngsters because growing up here, you know, you have friends of different cultures, of different religions, and the bonds that are formed amongst those friends are probably going to be the ones that are going to be maintained throughout your entire life. So if, if, the, if those bonds are not formed within the Hindu community itself, then, then, then there's no reason for, for people to, to want to maintain a, a tradition or go to the temple or do anything like that. So like, I, I do feel that those are probably the two biggest things there. There are other things as well as, uh, you know, looking at making sure that the services at the temple are, are you know, kept up to date, are, are modern, are catering to uh, younger people that that uh, you're not just going there for, for five minutes and then coming back out, uh, keeping things relevant, keeping things fresh. It's, it's, it's sort of modernizing what it means to be a Hindu, but at the same time, also uh, sticking to the roots of the tradition. Yeah, so that's that covers a lot. Um, so I guess uh, on the point about community um, as well, that's why a lot of organizations need to exist on campus, like like HSC, for example. Um, but on the first point about capturing the, the attention of younger minds, do you think it's just the fact that there's a lot of um, I guess, different sources of stimuli that people here living in the West have, where they're learning about a lot of different things, where the culture here is very different? Or do you think that there needs to be something different that's done by the Hindu community, Munders, and other institutions in particular to help capture that audience? It's probably more the latter. Um, I, I, I do feel that Munders themselves, um, while they, I, I do believe that they are necessary, whether they are the quickest to adopt new strategies of attracting youth and trying to maintain that uh, sort of uh, dynamic in environment uh, leaves a lot to be said. Um, a lot of the temples, when I do go, uh, you know, there's very little being done to, 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 to attract uh, uh, the younger people. And I do feel that that. Um, they have been slow to adopt. Um, now, that, that being said, I, I do know a, a lot of the younger organizations here in the greater, in the greater Toronto area have, have been doing amazing work in, in forming youth groups, in, in doing activities, and doing camps, and, and doing all of that to uh, sort of capture that, that attention. So while there are the distractions of social media and everything that is part of growing up in 2019, whether organizations have pivoted and tried to sort of change their, their approach, uh, probably more work needs to be done in that area. For sure. Um, and I think looking at your channel, one of the things that you've 
addressed also is the way in which um, Hindu dharma is often represented by a Western framework and a Western audience. Um, do you think that that's a huge problem uh, also, especially in Canada? I don't know that much about what the Hindu experience of living in Canada is like. Um, so could you share something about that? Maybe how, how much of an, an issue do you think that is coming from I, academic and media? Yeah, so I, I do think that um, growing up here in the West, um, a lot of how Hinduism is explained is not done in a proper manner in order to make young people growing up feel that they have the necessary tools to address uh, contemporary um, issues. And more often than not, uh, people that, you know, young people that learn more about Hinduism, they don't learn it in the temple. They learn it when they go to university. And, you know, you yourself will, will probably know is that if you're learning Hinduism in an academic setting where 99% of the professors are not of the Hindu tradition, then you're coming from a totally different perspective on how Hinduism is to be interpreted. Um, and that's a huge challenge that, you know, in the Bhavi class classes that I've, I have had to address. And, and now I can say that, you know, within my own community here is, is that when, when people in university start hearing about Hinduism in a modern day, like whether it be in the media or anything like that, they now watch it more with a critical eye. Uh, because, you know, they've, they've, they've gone through some of the things that I've spoken about, about academic Hindu phobia, about, you know, looking at sources and, and you know, this is where I, I, I think temples need to be that center of learning where young people can go to, to, to be their primary source of information. So that if, if me, you know, a teenager growing up, uh, ask a question about, well, you know, why, you know, why do I do Surya Namaskar in the morning? I shouldn't have to go to a university textbook to actually get that answer. You know, I, I should be able to go to the temple and, and make that my, my center of learning. And I, I think, you know, that's, that's where I think temples have to change. Um, and if they can do that, then, you know, like, uh, young people like myself, like I'm, I'm a new dad. So, so there's a new, uh, uh, baby in the family. And I know young families like, like myself, if the temple can be recognized as, as a center of learning, then I think that would attract, you know, a whole new generation of, of Hindus to actually be part of that community. Definitely. Um, do you think, so do you think that having younger instructors in, in, in Mandars, for example, you mentioned that you yourself got this idea for the YouTube channel when you were at your Balvihar class. Do you think having younger people in, in roles uh, of, of instruction and also roles of administration at Mundus can really help? 100%, the, without a doubt. The, the problem though is getting you know, management and, and things like that to actually see it, but it's also making younger people feel that, that they actually have a role in, in doing this. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of like, you know, you, you, you run yourself into a circular type of argument is that you want younger people to actually take up these, these roles, but then, you know, how do you find them without having like, you know, the quote unquote elders be part of that same conversation? Um, it's, it's not an easy thing to solve. It, it really isn't. And I find that the people that have actually done well have, have been those self-starters. Uh, people that, you know, that are teenagers right now, that are young adults, that are, you know, in, in their 30s, uh, those that are in universities that, that you know, be part of, like, organizations like, like the Hindu Student Council and, and things like that. Those are the self-starters that I think you need. Um, you know, it, how, how do you motivate people to, to actually be part of this? That that is something that I think you could spend hours trying to like wrap your head around. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and also start talking a little bit more about West Indian Hindu identity, which sure. I think is a fascinating, uh, I guess, substrand of the conversation that we've, having, we've been having so far, um, which has been focusing largely on Hindu identity here in the West. How in your view does West Indian Hindu identity differ from the identity of someone from an Indian background? So let's say someone, from an Indian background living here in the West? 
Yeah, that that's actually a very good question. Um, and it's, uh, it's a question that I've had to face uh, in my own experience here. And I must say that I, I have been blessed to actually be part of a larger Hindu community that certainly isn't just people like myself of a West Indian background. The, the biggest sort of thing that separates a West Indian Hindu from a Hindu of Indian background is the experience of actually leaving your country of origin and going somewhere that you had no idea what you were getting yourself into and where you cut all ties off from your motherland. Because of the severing of those ties, my great grandparents that actually came to the Caribbean, that came to the West Indies, it was a forced, it was something that was forced upon them is that, you know, if you wake up, say, say you wake up and you're living in India, you know, two minutes down the street from you is the temple that you go every morning. And it's something that you take for granted. You know, you don't even think anything of it. But imagine waking up in a new country and there is now nothing around you. And it's only when faced, in, when you're facing that in, your, in a new environment, it actually caused a change amongst West Indians to say that I have nothing here. Uh, so whatever I create in this new country, I must now hold on to that with, with 100% more strength and effort. So the West Indian Hindu experience, that's what frames that entire sort of background is that I have nothing that I must now create. And in that creation, it forces me to hold on to it more. One of the challenges, though, is that, that you know, you may not actually have all the information of someone that lives in India. So like all the intricacies of pujas and rituals and and, and uh, the, the loss of language, like all of that, you know, really influenced how a West Indian Hindu practices. But by forcing yourself to hold on to something means that in the subsequent generations that, that came about, so my parents, uh, when, when, when they left uh, Trinidad to come to the Toronto area, it was because, and, and the reason why they maintained that Hindu identity is because that's how they themselves grew up. So that primarily is what is how a West Indian Hindu differs from, I would say, an Indian Hindu growing up here in the West. So how that plays out in day-to-day -day life is, is that a West Indian Hindu would, would more often make it a practice to attend temple on a regular basis, without doubt. Now, whether they're like actively going and, and volunteering or doing anything like that, at least once a week, they would make an effort to, to go. Parents would enroll their kids to either learn to dance, to classical dance, learn to sing, to participate in music. Like it's holding on to all of those cultural traditions that a West Indian Hindu would probably differ from an Indian Hindu. And my own experience growing up here is, is that, you know, many um, Hindus from India will come up to me and, and they would start asking questions like, you don't speak Hindi. And I'm like, no, <laughs> but, but you participate regularly. You go temple, you're a tabla player, you're doing all this. I'm like, absolutely. And they're like, why? And I'm like, and, and it, it's only when people started asking me questions that I actually had to kind of stop and think about it. Cause for me growing up, that's just how life was is that, you know, your parents were like, okay, we're going to the temple. We have to do this puja you're you're going to learn to sing you're going to learn this instrument and that's just how life was so that i think you know in essence it is is what shapes the west indian hindu experience that's amazing so can i just ask you when you uh were learning music and when you, when you were singing uh could you understand the words behind what you were singing like were you also learning that so you know that's the other interesting thing so uh you know west indian hindus that that learn bhajans and kirtans and and all that I would say 90% of them don't understand what is it that they're saying, but that hasn't stopped them from actually learning it. Um, I would say more often, so, so, and, and that includes myself. 
what, ha what, what has happened though is that uh, more often than not, like, you know, many of us would try to find the translations for what is it that, that we're singing, just so that you do get a better understanding of it. But it just goes to like speak to how the importance of maintaining the tradition uh, was for West Indians is that regardless of whether you knew the language or not, you were learning how to sing. You were learning how to perform puja, to recite mantras. You were learning music. And, and whether you understood what you were doing or not, you still did it because that's who you were. Um, and today that still exists. So, so West Indians growing up here, um, people like myself, uh, you know, born here in Toronto, having starting families of their own, they are doing the same thing is that they get their kids involved because that's what they know. Yeah, very cool. So uh, I, there's a lot that I want to get to in what you said, but I just wanted to quickly go to a viewer question, our first sure. one. So this is very relevant to what you were just um, talking about. So this viewer is asking, in your experience, have you found that youngsters from India feel the same way um, about Hinduism as I suppose Western Indian Hindus do? Do you find that they look for the same things, say, if they were part of a student organization? It's, it's an interesting question. I, I, I think Hindus growing up here, regardless of their background are going to face the same challenges. So in short, the answer is yes. The difference from someone of my background, of a West Indian background, versus someone of an Indian background is that because we, because the cultural part of Hinduism, meaning music, dance, singing, all of that is being maintained, I, I do feel that 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 we are uh, participating a little bit more than I would say the average Indian Hindu. Um, so that's where like a West Indian Hindu would be part of Hindu student council and, and all of that, but also do these things outside of that. So it's it's not just a one facet type thing is that they they do try to encompass everything. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, one question that came up uh, to me when you were talking was just um, about current events and how they relate to Hinduism. So I think a lot of current events relating to Hinduism actually happen in India or they happen in the US. Uh, maybe that's just my bias, but how, do, how does a Western Indian audience actually engage with those types of issues? Are they something that um, becomes a part of Hindu identity for them or is it something that's very separate? Yeah, so a uh, story about Hinduism in India, how, how does it, you know, um, is it relevant to someone here growing up uh, is, is very um, interesting. And I would have to say that from my own perspective, because of my level of involvement, I would say that, yes, it affects me. Whether it affects the, the, the broader Hindu community, I, I would have to err on the side of, of, of no. Like I, I do find just amongst like West Indian Hindus is that if they hear about something happen, happening in, in India, they would say, well, you know, that's India. Whereas, you know, whereas I don't see it that way. Like I, I see it that if Hinduism is being attacked in India, that affects Hindus globally. Uh, but I, but that's because of my involvement, because of, me being a little bit more active in social media, being more glo globally aware of, of like the politics and, and how, Hindu, how Hinduism is being framed. But if I were to backtrack, say, uh, you know, high school, you know, I probably would have said the same thing, is that like, a, like Hinduism in, in India is different from, from me growing up here in Toronto and how I practice Hinduism. But in the advent of social media now, where we are now a much more global community, that conversation is starting to change. And I, and I think that's where uh, Hindus growing up here in the West have to take a little bit more active stance in, in combating a lot of the negative biases that are, are appearing. Because, you know, and now, now we're getting into the politics of uh, India, but because um, India is now, you know, on that verge of actually 
you know, exploding in their in, in in their in their economy and everything else. It's about time that like Hindus realize that how Hinduism is portrayed in India will ultimately influence how someone perceives me as a Hindu growing up here in the West. Because when they read an article in the Washington Post that talks about Hinduism, the first thing that they're going to say is that, oh, Sean, you're Hindu. What do you have to say about this? And am I going to answer is that, well, that's a different brand of Hinduism? Well, of course, the answer is no, because Hinduism, as it's portrayed, has to has to have an answer. And I think, you know, that because of now, you know, we're able to actually connect, you know, over things like this, uh, that is starting to change. Yeah, I think I think everything that you said resonates with me a lot. Um, and I think this isn't general. This isn't specifically a West Indian thing. It happens to people from all over Hindus from all over the world who are living in the U.S. and the West now. Um, I kind of see this as kind of an impediment towards a more unified Hindu identity or a unified Hindu community. Um, and I don't know if you agree with that, but how do you think we can sort of address um, that that gap and how do you think we can make younger people see these issues as relevant to their own lives and to their own personal hindu identity that's that's a tough thing because hinduism you know the the way i have experienced it has always been tied to the area of india that you were a part of so if you're punjabi hindu versus a south indian hindu versus a gujarati hindu versus a west indian hindu um, that has been and still is the most challenging aspect of being hindu i think in the west but at the same time i i do feel that as generations continue to grow in the west meaning a canadian hindu an american hindu a lot of these issues are going to be are going to now surface is, is is that something that affects a Hindu in South India is just as relevant as something that that same issue will now is now going to affect a Hindu growing up here in Canada. Um, the only way for for this to change is for more and more generations to now be, you know, to to have their roots here in, in the West. Uh, because I mean, like myself, I I was born here. My parents were born in Trinidad. So so that that is only one step. But you know, my kids and my kids' kids and and all of that, you know, they won't have any ties to those countries. Everything is going to be about Canada and the Hindu experience. You know, a hundred years from now. You know, it, I, I really do feel that it is going to be a global Hindu experience. And I think that if, if Hindus can can understand that and while while being respectful of the differences um, and, and, and answer any, um, any questions and make it seem that and, and make it real in the sense that any issue that affects a Hindu affects all Hindus globally. And... Are, are, are we there yet? Not, not quite, because I, I, I do feel that many of us still feel that whatever's happening in, in that area is just for that area. Uh, but younger people growing up here, like I think, I think it is something that is gonna be on their minds. Yeah, and I think younger people who are growing up here nowadays are in general more attuned to what's going on throughout the whole world. So that does help actually, in a yep. way. Uh, one question coming in from a viewer, which is related, um, but on, on a different angle is, um, how do you think that having played the tabla or engaging with classical Indian music has helped shape Hindu identity for West Indian Hindus or for Hindus in general? Uh, particularly for West Indian Hindus, music and dance, if it wasn't for those, those two things, I don't know if Hinduism would have survived the way that it did. Mm -hmm. uh, music was a unifying uh, aspect of the, of the culture and the environment growing up in the Caribbean. Um, 
like I I don't know any West Indian Hindu that doesn't know someone that is involved in the music scene or that is involved in the dance scene. Um, and I think it's actually, and like you can probably do a PhD on, on this, that music is the reason why Hinduism survived in the Caribbean without a doubt. And I, I'd be willing to like, you know, wager anything on that is that if someone wanted to like study that, that ultimately would be the answer that you come to 100%. That's really interesting because on the promotional poster we used for this episode, we used a picture of a tabla and a sitar. So I guess right. that was appropriate. <laughs> right. Um, that's really interesting. So are there specific ways in which you see this manifesting um, in, in the West Indies and in West Indian communities here in the, in the US and Canada? Like, are there specific t ways of celebrating festivals, ways of engaging in um, devotion at the Mandir that is very heavily centered on music? Yes. Um, so the Mandir that I attend, um, having your children involved in the weekly uh, kirtan class is something that all parents get their children involved with. Um, so from a very young age, they're participating um, in that. Um, I, I have to say that I'm, I'm fairly blessed to be growing up in the Toronto area because there's also a lot of good teachers of music as well. And parents do get their kids involved. Like a lot of West Indian parents want their children to learn music. The, and this is why it becomes important in the context of maintaining Hinduism is that if you're learning music, the question is, well, you're learning the skill. How do I showcase what I learn? The only place to really showcase these talents is in the temple itself. So by learning music, you're, you're forced to actually attend the temple because you want to showcase yourself. It gives you an opportunity to practice. And by just being there, you know, it gives you that sense of identity without a doubt. Yeah, that's, that's super important, super cool. Um, so for as far as your... Um, yeah, so sorry, there's actually a question coming in right now. Yep. Um, so there's uh, there's other popular Hindu channels uh, like uh, India in Details, which is run by Carolina Goswami, um, that have spoken about the difficulties of having time or getting the support that's needed to promote Hinduism on platforms like YouTube, uh, Facebook, whatever, social media. Um, what are some ways in which the Hindu community can do more to support your work online and uh, the work of others like yourself? Um, that's the, so that's the first question. Hmm. Um, personally speaking, um, like I, I don't need any monetary support or um, anything like that. I, I, I think where Hinduism is lacking is for people themselves to be, uh, to be like self promoters in the sense. Uh, so like, where I'm going with this is that say if I do a video um, and I post it to YouTube and I ask just amongst the people that I know, so you watch the video and they're like, yeah. And then you ask, so, and the next question, so did you share it? Well, no, I just kind of watched it. So, you know, it, I think Hindus have to support Hindus. Um, for, for myself, like I, I don't need monetary support or um, anything like that. But where the support is needed is in terms of spreading the word. Um, you know, that's, that's where I, I see things, uh, where things need to happen. Now, if we are to talk about monetary support, like where Hindus really need to kind of focus on is that, you know, it's, it's one thing to be like, you know, screaming in social media and, and, and like saying this and like doing that. But the way it's packaged has to be done in a professional manner. Um, and one of the things that, that I noticed when I was like searching on YouTube and, and trying to find videos about Hindus is that a lot of the stuff that is out there is really amateurish. Uh, and, and that, you know, that's where things can be improved. So where I'm going with this is that India has a lot of filmmakers. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is not something that they're short of. The question is, where are these people in this space? Because the Bollywood industry is so huge 
that I'm sure there are there are Hindus within the Bollywood industry that can do videos of what I'm doing a hundred times better. But but that isn't there. And and that's what I found very surprising is is that you know you have this this billion dollar industry and yet if you search on YouTube for anything relating to Hinduism all you're getting is people with their cell phones recording videos where the audio is 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 of a you know bad quality and like the video shaky but nothing of the nature of a professional level so where the support is needed is getting behind these people and trying to like start something on your own and actually doing it um, that I, I think is is the hardest thing right and to your point about uh people not stepping up to the plate and supporting um i think one of the things and this goes to the 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 questioner second question um is that a lot of uh, younger people especially aren't very um confident with being public about their hindu identity like it's something that we think is very private and we are comfortable being in that space in the mandir or comfortable being in that space in our own student group but when it comes to engaging with the rest of the world in a very public way about our hindu identity we kind of shrink away um so this person's asking related to that how can we actually get students to be more confident in speaking about hinduism and in being ambassadors of hindu dharma confidence comes from being comfortable in your own skin um that is not something that just comes overnight you can only have confidence in yourself if if you know to yourself why is it you are hindu um uh i remember participating in a hindu conference a couple of years ago uh where a question was asked is that you know are you hindu by virtue of the fact that you are born a hindu or are you hindu because you choose to be hindu and if if you ask yourself that question then that's where the confidence come from if if you can answer why you choose to be hindu then you wouldn't have a problem being public about your faith so like from my own example um uh, i like i my twitter profile is public so that means that whatever i share on twitter in relation to hinduism can be viewable by my coworkers and we're you know have have no idea of what is it that i'm doing but it's it's something that i i'm not afraid of and people you know have actually and now when i'm at work like i don't actively go and tell people i i started this youtube channel so you guys have to watch it blah 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 you know it's something that i i just do it and, and now people are coming and now they're asking me because because they 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 were on the internet they uh, they uh, google my name for for whatever reason and now they're seeing me now if if you don't know who you are as a person and people ask you questions then then you're not going to have that confidence to answer so if you can answer the question of why you choose to be hindu that's the starting point to gaining confidence in portraying yourself as hindu in the public space and i i think many people never ask themselves that question about why do they choose to be hindu and i think for a lot of youngsters that it's it's not a question that ever comes up is that you you just do it because well that's that's the faith that you grew up in this is what you've been doing from the start so i'm just going to carry on i think that's a really really good suggestion really important suggestion very basic suggestion also something that you would think would be taught to to the young children sort of right out the right when they're getting their basic education at a mandir but i think actually isn't but once you can sort of list those points list those things that attach you to a hindu identity then it becomes very easy for you to convey that in public as well um so i think that's an excellent suggestion for for our younger viewers as well um so one question that's coming in or one comment that's coming in right now is that there's a lot of um uh attempts i guess to portray hindu dharma as being anti-feminist as anti-woman um this also ties in a little bit to the the shabri mala um controversy that's happening right now in kerala and india um so how would you as a younger person who's um you know obviously engaging with the west try to combat that type of negative stereotype about hindu dharma as an example yeah <laughs> so uh talking about 
feminism and its portrayal of Hinduism as anti-feminist is something that I think uh, needs to be addressed, one one hundred percent. It's unfortunate that Hinduism, as it's portrayed and in the media and in the context of this, of the situation that's that's ongoing in India right now, it's a shame that Hinduism is being branded as anti-feminist. Um, you know, the funny thing is is that no one within my own community like this is not even on their radar. Um, and the reason for that is that being of a West Indian Hindu identity, like this is not something that, that you would think anything of. The few people that I have seen actually talk about it, um, you know, shared the articles that you would find on Washington Post and, and things like that. So I, I remember commenting on one of the, on something that was shared on Facebook and I said, you know, it's one thing to label a practice as being anti-woman or anything like that. But at the same time, you need to understand the context of the tradition as, as it stands. And I, I think for Hindus growing up here, um, it's a shame that, that, you know, this sort of postmodernist interpretation of Hinduism is what's getting play in the media. And, you know, that's a, that's, that's a huge topic that, that, you know, you could spend a whole other s- session on. Where I think young Hindus need to focus on is they need to understand Hinduism not in the context of modern day definitions of oppression, of uh, social hierarchies and all of that, but understand the Hindu tradition within the context of Hinduism. Don't take an external way of trying to classify the world and try then to reanalyze Hinduism. That, I think, is the biggest problem. And it's something that I have tried to convey to a lot of the people that I've interacted with within the the Balvigas classes and all of that, is that if you try to view Hinduism through the lens of someone who views all society as being products of oppression, then of course you're going to find something within Hinduism to fit that definition. But why don't you ask the people that are actual practitioners of Hinduism to tell you what it means to them? And that is what the definition has to be about. So it can't be about that, you know, feminism says that people that that are participating in this tradition are are being, you know, anti-women. When you look at the protests that happened, that was led by women, you know, saying that they're ready to wait. You know, that that's that's a pretty big thing. So any type of external definition has to be fought. It, it, it has to be fought. Hinduism has to be understood by the practitioners of the faith not by the Supreme Court judgment. Yeah, and I think re-owning the narrative about Hindu identity is gonna take a long time, but having people like you who are talking about it in the public spaces is a really important first step. Um, There's a question coming in from a viewer, Nilesh Bharan, um, which is, uh, in your opinion, Sean, what would be the biggest uh, single piece of advice you could give to us um, who are teaching children, younger children at Munders? What is the single aspect that we should focus on the most? Is it language, music, uh, scriptural knowledge, uh, culture in general? Um, And to add to his question, is there a single answer to that? I don't know if there's a single answer, but if I had to focus on one thing, um, I would even take music and all of that out of it. Um, You need to focus on getting youngsters to understand everything that is being done within the context of a temple, within the context of Hindu worship. If if that is being done, then everything falls into place. And the reason why I say that is that you could have people that learn music, that do all of this, 
but don't understand anything that they're doing. And then, you know, if, if those same people grow up and they have children and those children start questioning and they don't have an answer to give them, then, then you're stuck. So while I do agree that, that you have to, you know, the music and, and all of that forms part of this like total package, those that are part of these Baal Vihar, the Baal Vikas, the Baal Gokulam classes need to really focus on getting kids to understand the rationality of Hindu practices. That has really been the focus of the classes that, that I was a part of, and I'm still a part of now, because everything else will fall into place. They don't need to come to me to, to learn music. Mind you, I'm still happy to teach that, but but, you know, they need people that can actually get down and kind of break things down on a level that is relatable and that is understandable. So for those that are watching that are part of these classes, make it relevant, keep it simple. And by all, like, do whatever you have to do to get them to understand why Hindus do the things that they do. Um, and by doing that, you know, the practices of Hindus add value to your life. Yeah, I think uh, getting younger people to understand the worldview and the logic underlying a lot of Hindu practices um, is a really important insight that you've given us. Um, before we go, because we've uh, reached sort of the end of our journey here today, um, would you have anything else to add, any piece of sage advice for the younger um, college age and younger professional audience out there who's trying to navigate the workplace, um, you know, has a lot of friends who are very diverse living in, in a Western society, but also want to engage more deeply with Hindu Dharma. I, uh, my first piece of advice is that don't think being Hindu and asserting your identity is going to be a detriment to you advancing in your workplace. Um, that I, I, I've seen that amongst people of my own generation where the focus really has been about, uh, you know what, I need to like disassociate from these practices and everything else because they're considered backwards. Um, and, you know, that, that stems from like not understanding what is it that they're a part of. Where I think youngsters need to focus on, and when I mean youngsters, I, I mean like, like, like high schoolers, those that are in college, now entering the workforce and all of that, use your Hindu identity to your advantage. Meaning that there's so much like, even if you're not of that devotional mindset, there is so much that Hinduism can offer the world that, that relates to your health, that relates to your well-being, you know, there's there's so many things that Hinduism has to offer that you can actually draw upon and take solace in, in knowing that you are part of that tradition. I, I I mean, one of like the big things that's that's coming up now is this whole mindfulness type thing, where you know, <laughs> whenever I hear it, I, I I just start to laugh to myself because it's kind of like, well, well, yeah you know, we, we all know this. So to anyone that's growing up and you're entering the, the workforce, always make sure that, that your identity is grounded in your sense of being Hindu. And being Hindu is not going to be something that prevents you from advancing in the workplace. But being Hindu is something that could actually bring you higher within your career to elevate you in your life because that certainly has been my own experience, 100%. Yeah, that's a really, really good note to end on. Before we do leave, I also want to add one really tangible thing that younger people can do um, to help them connect better with their Hindu identity is to subscribe to Sean Binda's YouTube channel, Hindu Lifestyle. So please, uh, before you close the browser, please do check it out um, on YouTube. Once again, his channel is Hindu Lifestyle. His, vid his videos are really, really amazing. Um, very short to the point and sorry do you want to do you want to add something yeah um so uh many people have been asking me why i haven't posted a video in in a while so let me just uh videos will be coming out shortly again uh, but i did welcome our son into the world in august 
and welcoming a new baby while I realized would have uprooted all of my routines and everything that I had because I actually had a schedule of how videos were happening once he came uh, all of that sort of went out the window. Uh, I, I must say that uh, it has been a great sort of a great experience. Um, but as we sort of progress, vigils will start back up again once I can figure out how how my new routine is is going to work. But uh, the channel is still there, HinduLifestyle.ca. Uh, vigils will start back uh, most likely in the month of March. Uh, that's that's what I'm aiming for. I, I have a whole slew of content and, and things that I want to address. And I am hoping to start back posting. Uh, by that time, my, my son will be about uh, seven months or so, which, which then kind of, you know, we can settle back into a routine. That's awesome. Uh, congratulations to both you and your wife. Uh, and we look forward to seeing your new videos. Uh, and obviously, for people who aren't um, regular viewers already, you can go and watch the content that's already up there. There's a lot of uh, content that's available right now. Um, so Sean, thank you again for joining us here on Church Chat today. And um, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you very much. And to everyone that's uh, tuned in, uh, thank you very much for listening to what I have to say. Um, if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to, to contact me. Uh, you can get my YouTube channel at hindulifestyle.ca. Uh, and that leads you right to uh, the YouTube channel page. All right, thank you again, Sean, and namaste, everyone. Namaste.